Hi, it is Wednesday at noon, so this is Writing Wednesday with Janet Fitch. That's me answering your writing questions. So uh, if you have questions as we go along, put them in comments and I'll do my darndest to answer them. Uh, it is trash day and the trash trucks are late, so you're going to hear them clashing around. This is uh, not pre-recorded <laughs> or edited in any way. So this is my life as, uh, as it comes. So welcome to Writing Wednesday. Um, today I got some questions from uh, readers or writers, reader writers, uh, viewer writers, um, which I'll address. Uh, but first I wanted to say, hi Peggy, I wanted to Give my love to everybody who is in the fire area, um, California, Oregon, Washington, and uh, parts there thereof is uh, is crazy, and uh, we're all staying inside uh, trying to breathe. Um, and our local areas are uh, the firefighters are really working hard uh, to keep fire away from the foothill communities and uh, uh, Mount. Uh, Mount Wilson, where a huge telescope, you know, tremendous science discoveries for the last hundred years, and all of our telecommunications. So um, I don't even know if we'll have internet if Mount Wilson goes out. So um, uh, sending out a lot of love to you guys and to everybody who's home homeschooling children. Uh, you know, it's a time for, I hope teachers are able to be creative and not try to to teach what they would teach in a classroom because uh, it's a time of uh, a big shift and uh, teaching is is uh, it, you know it's a creative act and as a creative act you work in the moment you work with people in front of you uh, things might occur to you that wouldn't have uh, teaching in a conventional classroom and speaking of teaching uh, I know that um, um, many of you know I'll be teaching a um, um, weekend intensive on writing uh, from the senses because I think we need this desperately right now. Uh, we're all sitting here in our houses, locked down, tape on the windows if you're in the fire area, uh, and needing um, something to expand our world rather than making it smaller and writing from the senses gives you another dimension or five more dimensions uh, of space and possibility. So if you go on to um, uh, communityofwriters.org, um, I'll be teaching uh, 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 writing from the senses uh, October 9th. 10th and 11th, so Friday night, Saturday morning and evening, Sunday morning and evening, um, and we'll unlock some of those doors for you. Um, I think the senses are uh, one of the great keys to uh, unlocking the imagination and unlocking memory. Memory and imagination go together. Um, and uh, putting you back in the body, putting the reader in the body of the story, putting the reader in the body of your protagonist. Uh, I don't think anything could be more engaging than that. So if you ever hear people say, oh, I could walk right, you know, people have said it to me, you know, or things you've read, you know, I can walk right in, I can, I feel like I'm in the story. Well, that's because the, re the writer has put you in the body of the character and you can do that and uh, we'll be examining the senses one at a time and seeing what they're good for and how to put that together um, first how to observe closely and then how to give language to what you're observing uh, people s see something uh, I, I've said this before my daughter went backpacking in Utah and was at Green Mesa and they were up at the top of Green Mesa at sunset and they looked out at this expanse of the broken mesa land and the sunset and the greens and the reds and um, and somebody said there are no words to describe this and my daughter of course the daughter of a writer said yes there are you know yes there are you just don't have them <laughs> and to be able to describe a complex 
landscape like that, you have to first be able to describe something as simple as a hairbrush. Um, so we're going to be looking at uh, using all the senses. It's going to be an intense, intensive weekend. Um, normally you'd be going somewhere um, and taking the class and being there, um, you know, on a retreat or you know, if I had taught it at, you know, some extension program, you'd be going and spending all day there. But we can't, the screens are different, you know, you have to interact with the reality that you're in and I think it's too tiring to have three hours, an hour break, and three hours um, when you're not in real time with in real physical reality with people. You're in your own physical reality though so it's going to be two hours in the morning, two hours at night and then you'll do some work in the middle uh, on your own. And there'll be breakout rooms, so you'll be able to interact with the other people without me necessarily hovering over you. So it'll be, have a community, because everything they do at um, the community of writers, formerly Swa Valley, um, uh, has, you know, they really want to have a community, at, always a community aspect. So there will be breakout rooms where you can go in and talk to people who are taking it as well, share your enthusiasm, share stories, um, you know, questions, uh, maybe something you wrote, you'll be able to post that uh, and have, have that community as well. So that's very cool. All right. So uh, anyway, that's the writing from the census class I'll be taking and I'll post it here as well. So you don't have to write that down right now if you don't want to. Um, but I had a couple of questions. Hi, everybody. I just appreciate your being here. Brenda and Roberta and Peggy, Vicki. <laughs> I feel like Sheriff John, uh, who was a t TV show when I was a kid at a magic mirror and could look and see everybody. Hi, <laughs> Amy and Jill. Hi, Jeffrey, Sayward, and Ruthie. Oh, Ruthie's already signing up. Very cool. Uh, I know Brenda did as well. Hi, Hillary. Um, hi, Peggy. Peggy's going to be doing that as well. All right. So um, here are my got some questions this uh, for this one. And I, um, if you have writing questions that come up, put them in comments, and I'll try to reach them. This is from Amy. Is Amy here? Yes, you are. I'm doing your question. Um, do you ever get lost in your own plot? Uh, confuse your, your story. Uh, Amy's been working on a novel for about four months and feels overwhelmed with what she's written. Do I need an outline? Although I'm mo more of a pantser, meaning seat of the pants. Me too. Um, it stresses me out every time I do it. Uh, I'm more exciting for the editing process than I am about getting it down. How do I overcome fear of getting out of the first draft? Okay, the, there's two questions. Let's talk about the keeping track of of the plot. I've put away a lot of my notebooks from Marina M, which was a were a lot of moving pieces in that. But even in the new one uh, that I'm working on right now, um, it's very helpful to open it have a document that just is say it chapter by chapter what went on who is in the chapter what happened and keep track of time uh, my current book is t so far has taken place a very narrow uh, range of time so it's five days so far but I want to know, God, when did that happen? Was that Thursday or Friday, you know? So I can look at this sheet or two. I'm big into printing stuff out and putting it in a three ring binder, like a small, like one of the skinny, let's see, a, you know, skinny binder like that, you know, little tiny one. And I reuse stuff, you know, the other binders. Um, uh, so and put that little chronology or timeline with description. I did this for Marina. I needed that desperately, you know, when you're working on a very long novel. It's like, you know, what happened in this chapter? What happened? What exactly happened? What happened in this chapter? Uh, so you can keep track of what you've already written. Um, 
as you know so i'm into into just typing it up as a you know chapter one chapter two chapter three and what happened in those chapters uh doesn't even have to be full sentence it's just a little list and it, is it day or night interior exterior how many characters are involved what are their names so it's like you know how long has it been since i've used greg in a there was no greg and marina m but grigori <laughs> how long has it been since you know we've seen varvara um okay that's four chapters back um maybe you were ripe to use her again you know it, it just getting it keeping that together is so important and i use a three ring binder some people will use a whiteboard um, and make a grid you know of the scene where it is what happened who's in the scene um, and that will help you keep track of what you've already done chaptering does you know um, if you have left chaptering for some later draft you'll find it's easier to chapter as you go it makes it to break it up and make it easier to keep track um, and I name my chapters. I don't just go chapter one, chapter two. You know, I always, each chapter has a name, which is the name of the file. So I can look down the list and see the file uh, or subfile. Um, okay, let me, let me just give you an example from what I'm working on. Um, Uh, you know, the chase, say, um, you want to, um, uh, like my chapter, you know, it could be LACMA. So I remember LACMA. Okay, this is what I did in LACMA. Uh, I work first draft in Scrivener. We've talked about Scrivener. And if you go back into the videos, I had a, a student, April Davila, who is a uh, Scrivener Maven came on to talk about Scrivener with me and how how that works. Um, but you can just easily keep track of things in your uh, um, on a sheet of paper with, you know, where is it? When is it? Who's in the scene? What's the essential movement of the scene? Uh, if you can't do that, you're not writing in scenes, which could be part of the problem. If it's a lot of telling that slops around um, vague locations, vague and a lot to a lot of movement without completing a scene. So there could also be scene problems that if you're if you're not writing definite scenes, then it's very hard to keep hold of your plot. Um, so remember to start and end a scene in one place, one time, one scene, the Aristotelian unities of time and place. Um, so often that is like super important. Then keep track of your plot by, you know, you'll know what happened in each scene. It seems like maybe you're having trouble with the scenes that are coming up and how to keep track of what you plan to do. That's a simple list. I don't believe in outlines. One, A, B, two, you know, all that elementary school stuff. That doesn't work. Um, simple, what I call a sketch outline, which is simply a list. You know, these are scenes that I see coming up. You know, uh, John and Mary fist fight in the car over parking. Uh, marital tensions heating up, you know. Um, uh, uh, John goes out for a walk, doesn't come back. Uh, Mary is, uh, 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 gets loaded and, and falls and passes out, you know. And so you have the, a list of these scenes and then you can always cut them up and rearrange them. Maybe you don't want them in that order. Uh, you can also, you don't have to even write in chronological order. You can write those scenes, put them in a box, and arrange them later if you want. Um, but if it's keeping you from writing, I haven't touched it in a month. Um, <coughs> it's a good idea to 
do this work, go through what you've already got, chapter or scene, what happens in the scene, make sure you have scenes, and then, you know, maybe a list of the things to come uh, will help you a lot. Um, and uh, if you are, uh, it stresses you out to come back to it. And it's always nerve wracking not to know where you're going. And my wonderful um, uh, writing teacher, Kate Braverman, uh, used, to, used to say, there's no such thing as a permanent state of grace. And so this is what happens when you write something really good this happened to me. I wrote something really good. I just had a, and the scene just ended. It was killer. And I was so excited. I was so happy. And then I couldn't write again for a couple of days because everything I did seemed awful. So I'd write one day and then throw that out and write that the next day, write something else the next day, just what comes next, what comes next. And I finally got sick of myself doing that. And now I'm just going to write one of the scenes that I see in my head that's going to happen some, at some point. And I'll worry about how to get from that great scene to the next scene. I don't see how, where that comes in. And it doesn't really matter. You know, writing is not, doesn't have to be linear. I can come back later and f find a way to make those uh have one lead to another. I, I, I don't have to do it now. Um, but try to keep working even if you're throwing stuff out every day. You know, you just have to develop the fortitude to keep working. Even if you do an exercise, like these sense record exercises uh, that I'm going to be doing uh, with, with um, the community of writers, this little course that I'm teaching in October. Um, a sense exercise, a word exercise, a sentence exercise, you know, I've, a lot of these have little exercises that feed into your book. So if you know it's summer, it's fire, uh, it's uh, hot, you can do a sense exercise of what is it like to be in the heat in, with the fires impending in at this period do the weather uh, just stay sensitized it's almost like uh, you know like in the movies the safe crackers you know take the take the sandpaper you know to sensitize their fingertips so these little exercises will keep you sensitized so that when you can force yourself back to work things come up you know uh, also keep you know read the things that energize you that makes you make you want to go back and write um, rather than the reading the stuff that helps you escape from your writing and just, you know, it's like eating a bag of Doritos. You don't want that. You know, you want to read stuff that makes you want to write. Um, um, so maybe you, I'm afraid of the vomit draft. Okay. Now that is probably, a, a not a good a description of what you're doing um, you know your first draft I always think of it as as um, you've fastened something to the tree on the other side of the river and you're just you're pulling yourself over the stream you know so there is something that happened in the scene just before you stop writing that is like sending a line forward and you'd have to figure out what that is. You know, we talked about scene. Um, something happens in a scene where you can't go back to the way it was before. So look for that change the last time there was one. And then you can maybe hook on to that. Try to, try to do a contrast. So if you had a really super intense one-on-one, -on -one, you know, arm wrestling scene, maybe you want it a bigger multi-character outdoor scene in a kind of a different direction. Okay, Kimberly says, if a character has a significant part in the beginning of the novel, do you think that character needs to reemerge? Yeah, 
especially in the beginning, you're setting up expectation. I mean, unless you kill them, why are you putting them in? You're, you, you know, you're telling the reader that this is a significant part of your story. So you build a doorway and then you walk through the doorway that you've built. So if you have a, if a character has, has a significant part in the beginning and isn't going to be significant in the book, um, you can shift the perspective to a point of view character who gets something out of that. So it's like that character isn't as important as what the interaction does to send your point of view character forward. Uh, but you don't want them to just disappear and whatever happened to Joe, you know, I thought that that was her husband, you know. I mean, you can get rid of them, but it should be significant to the movement of the of the narrator. Um, Ruthie says, I'm writing a first POV of a young 16-year-old. Trouble is, she is as naive, as naive as she is, I'm afraid she might come across knowing more than she should. Well, they're very intelligent 16-year-olds, you know. But yeah, if you're if you worry about it, if it's something that you want a tremendously naive character, you know, you can have her showing that she believes things that a more mature reader knows are, you know, is not going to hold true. Um, so, yeah, you're just going to have to, you know, you obviously have a sense of it already. Um, so you'll just have to be vigilant and watch for that. Um, the question is, you know, does an adult reader want to read a story about a very naive 16-year-old girl from her own point of view, first person, in her language? You know, is that going to be a narrator that we're going to want to follow? Um, what else have we here? <laughs> Vicky is playing teacher to second graders. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're all, it's a lot of teaching going on, isn't it? All right, second question. Uh, tonight, today was something that's been on my mind is writing a character who is very different from myself. Um, and I'm going to skip the, uh, the specifics because uh, this is this person's thing but it's set in it's set abroad and involves some um women from another country working in a u.s government official's house and also secondary characters from this foreign uh locale um any and also wants to do some characters from the LGBTQ plus community, uh, which this writer is not in that community. Um, any guidance on writing real, realistic characters who are part of a culture or community completely different from your own? Um, well, you have to do the research. You have to, you know, know know people from that community hear them talk to them watch movies set in that you know in that world not american movies but you know movies from that country um read about you know if you you know what are the foods what are the books what are what's the music what are schools uh you know uh what are at the attitudes i mean it's a deep dive if you are completely unfamiliar with that country and their customs and their language and practices. You know, it's a deep dive. Uh, usually people write about cultures that if they are not from that culture, there are, there are cultures that you have been interested in, have read about, have considered, have, you know, kind of immersed yourself in. And then you owe it to that 
you know, to the verisimilitude of your writing to contact people from that culture and have them read what you've done and uh, or interview them and get information, get, you know, you, you'll learn things, you, you know, I, I'm not a foster child, but I interviewed uh, women. I knew two foster children when I was growing up and uh but i knew i didn't know enough to write astrid's book i was writing her you know i was writing the book but i continued to do research continued to track down people who had been foster daughters interviewed you know interviewing them asking the questions getting information things that i would never ever have imagined couldn't have made up um and then noticed when they were saying similar things, then that was super significant. You know, if this was the experience of this person and this person and this person and this person, it's like, okay, that is the DNA of that cultural experience. So if you, um, you know, luckily we live in Southern California with every ethnic group and every cultural group and every nationality is here and you can talk to people uh, in depth you can, you know, figure out where, how to get to people. You have to figure out where, uh, where they, where, where are you going to find them? Like I wanted to talk to foster daughters who had been recently in the system because you're not allowed to talk to foster children. You know, random strangers are not allowed to, you know, find kids actually in the system and talk to them, which makes good sense actually. Um, there weren't a lot of foster um, or organizations for former foster children uh, back then. They were very closeted. Uh, people didn't want people to know. Um, so what I did is I thought about where would they be. So I um, I put up signs in uh, at Planned Parenthood where young women, especially not of means, go for birth control. Um, and I put up signs in the 12-step rooms because I figured people coming out of foster care often, you know, have substance, you know, it's very stressful and there can be substance abuse uh, problems that they would resort to uh, uh, f free of charge um, groups that can help. So, and then I got a, one of those, you know, phones that a phone number that wasn't my own phone number that they could call and they would call and I had a, there was a voice recording you know so they could call and uh you know the this says leave a message if if you you know a time that I can call you back and how you want me to ask for you uh so uh they would call me I would call them back and uh I'd ask them questions, you know, how did you, what was it like, how, how many homes, were you in group home, were you, you know, you have to have your questions ready, and good questions, you know, say I wanted to talk to, you know, Ethiopians, you know, you put out a call for people, do you know Ethiopians, anybody know some Ethiopians, you go to little Ethiopia, you know, in, uh, on Fairfax, and go into the shops, and, you know, I'd like to, I'm writing a book, you know, I've got an Ethiopian character, I, uh, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about, you know, about things, and you talk around, and sometimes you, you know, there's somebody that, yeah, you know, this person really is happy to work with me, you know, you give them what you've written and you say, you know, after you have a relationship, uh, you, you know, and you go, what do you think of this Ethiopian character? Is it a character? Is that something they would say? Is that something they would do? But mostly just your interview should just be sharp. You should have really good questions and um, make sure that what you're doing is right. Uh, not just one person. You need, you know, several people. Uh, if you're talking to, you know, if you want to have, say, a, a trans character, uh, trans, um, you know, then it's, is it, you know, is this a trans character who has gone from he to she? Are they they? You know, how, how do they get addressed? What era is it? Um, and if you don't know anybody, 
I guarantee you that you know somebody who knows somebody. And just get those questions, have a good long chat, and more than one probably, and you know, with that person and try to get other people so that you really get a feeling for life as it's lived. Uh, you cannot guess at people. You cannot have, you know, somebody from an ethnicity uh, that you don't have friends who, you know, you can think, oh, you know, how would, you know, how would Deborah say that? Or how, you know, what are, you know, and read up, read up and just get as much on that culture as you possibly can, what they worry about and what, you know, gr you know, just food, beauty, um, health, all of the three-dimensional character study. What do you, you know, what would this character read? What are they, what's their religious beliefs? You know, and every, how do you avoid stereotypes was this the question here. And the question of stereotypes is, there's no such thing as a generic person. Every person is different. Um, you know, there's only, there's no such thing as a stereotype. There's no such thing as a generic person. There are only people who are not, there's only writers who are not observant and curious and challenging themselves to get it right. So there's only sloppy writing. This, you know, laziness is what it is. And an ability to be sympathetic to, you know, how other people live. And, um, you know, it's it, there's a very big difference between writing about somebody from another culture and um, you pretending that you're from that culture. You have to find out, find out, find out. And make sure that you get a, that they read it. You know, I did that with the punk rock book. I was writing, I was around the scene, but I wasn't, you know, a big punk rocker. Uh, so when I wrote that book, I had somebody who was in that scene read it and what was right, what was wrong, and willing to be open and change it. Um, I don't know if I would take somebody, well, Marina, I did you know, took somebody from a completely different country and milieu and, and write it in the first person. But this was a highly educated person, world culture. Uh, so we did have some similarities. Um, but I had to, f I got stuff wrong, wrong, wrong when I was, you know, earlier drafts, um, misunderstood things just about how her family worked. Uh, but I talked to somebody who was a translator and very familiar with that milieu and he said, oh, God, no, not that, not that. Oh, God, you have to be able to write it in a way that somebody from that group will read it and go, yep, yep, that's right. I got it right. That's what you want. Um, and it's very... Uh, um, it's very rewarding when you get somebody, you know, I have a friend who's Russian and, and read Marina and said, oh, thank God I can have my children read this and things I've tried to explain to them. Now I don't, yeah, they can just read your book. It's like, yeah, you know, former foster children writing to me. Yep, you know, punk rockers writing to me, yeah. So that's what you want, you know, and that's the, that's the quality of honesty with yourself that you need to have. Um, Let's see what else we have. Um, my, he has a, she has a protagonist. Linda Moore has a minor character uh, who is a security guard out of shape. Uh, and her critique group thought Julio seemed a negative stereotype and I should change him. Well, if this is what people are reading and are telling you something that, you know, take it on, you know, how, how can you disrupt expectations about somebody? You know, if people expect your woman to be docile and you make her piercingly inc incisive, you're disrupting, um, expectations. If you have your security guard is pudgy and 
we expect them to be slow, but instead they're surprisingly athletic. I mean, I've known pudgy people who are, you know, quite quick and strong. Um, so you surprise, you know, whenever you surprise us, uh, do something that we're not expecting. That's how you bust a stereotype. Um, um, Crafting a character from another race, Marla was saying, is, let's get this out of there, um, was something that, it, this is too long, I can't get to the end of it. Well, anyway, um, we say fluffy in our house instead of pudgy. Yeah. Um, your advice is along the lines what they were saying, yeah. Um, if the character isn't likable, okay, there's another thing that Megan's talking about. Liking the voice, but the people say the character isn't likable. Um, if they are interesting, they don't have to be likable. If we want to see some savage, murderous, diabolical character that we wouldn't want to, you know, have on in our on our in our quilting group or something like that, but they're fascinating. You know, they don't have to be likable. They have to be fascinating. Um, so this is something that people who want to be cozy with characters often don't like the character. But there's sometimes that people are just, I have certainly read this. I don't call it likable, but where I just don't want to be with them for very long. I, I've certainly been in moods where I've picked up a book and the character has some, they, you know, the writer has some kind of a nasty uh, protagonist that doesn't fascinate me. And I just think, I don't want to spend 300 pages with this person. You know, so if you're going to have an unlikable character, there's got to be something intriguing about them. And remember that nobody, no villains um, see themselves as villainous. They see themselves as perfectly justified. So, um, you know, there, there's a little bit, you know, you can give them some admirable characteristics and then that really upsets the reader. Uh, <laughs> What else? Um, what, let's see. You should know when you have an unlikable character, especially your protagonist. Um, and know that you have to keep people interested in them. Often if they're unlikable, but they're antagonist is even more unlikable then you sort of like them because they're up against like some really bad person you know you look at the talented mr ripley um he you know he inv he takes over the life of dicky wasn't it dicky um and dicky is a dickhead you know so we don't like ripley but the other guy is like really obnoxious, like a, you know, a Trump son. Uh, it's like, okay, well, good luck deal, you know, but then we start to feel sorry for him because Ripley turns out to be really bad. Uh, it's interesting. Do you read contemporary fiction? Yeah, of course. Uh, curious who favorite fiction authors are. My favorite fiction authors. Um, uh, you know, I'm just, every time I read somebody new, I'm just, I fall in love with them. Um, so many good authors that I can't, I can't do that. Uh, just off the top of my head, there are so many good ones. Uh, hmm, now it's going to, it's going to haunt me. Um, so I always remember the worst of people in the world, like the East Area Rapists, still have families and other parts of their lives that might seem common. Um, 
maybe even kind. So those kind of people who intrigue me. Yeah, people have secret lives. People have aspects of themselves. The worst people are often good family people, the godfather, you know. They're good, oh, so good to their families. Oh, they really like animals. They're good to children. You know, it's a complex character. They just don't see other people as people. There's their family. Those are people. Their little tribe. But other people are not even people. That's how they, that's how they function. Um, all right, well, let's look at this. This one had a bunch of questions about, um, uh, Oh, like the trans, you know, uh, this person with the diff, you know, looking for avoiding stereotypes. Uh, uh, that I have a number of friends who have came, come out as trans recently, aware of the stereotypes and the pre prejudices. So very aware of them as individuals. Yeah. So every, you know, every group of people are going to have, you know, everybody's different, you know, every ethnic group, every nationality, um, you know, so even if they all do the same work, even if they all maybe uh, have, you know, general physical um, similarities, they're going to be as different as look at the Beatles, you know, it's like to somebody who doesn't relate to, you know, shaggy haired young white men, they all look the same. It's like these long-haired white men, you know, dressed up in crazy clothes, you know. <laughs> Whereas to somebody who's into the Beatles, it's like you couldn't be any more different than Paul and George. You just couldn't. Um, well, so it's all the lens. So when you're, you know, when you're creating characters, you're looking to really characterize the difference of temperament the look at the three-dimensional character study that we've talked about um, uh, in Lagos Egri's um, Art of Dramatic Writing. Um, you know, somebody reads, somebody doesn't read. What, what are their dreams? What are their hopes? Not everybody has the same hopes, dreams. What are their fantasies? What do they read? What do they do for fun? What are their religious beliefs? What are their, you know... Um, What's their kind of temperament out in the world? Um, you know, what are their obligations? What do they wish was different? Um, uh, start answering those questions, and you get out of the, you get out of your box. Um, and then this is a common question that we're all going through right now: is I personally struggle with putting writing first when there's a day job of family and friends who want to connect on Zoom when I'd just rather hide in the guest room and ignore the world. Did you have a period where you had the day job, encroaching on your writing time, any tricks to block out the world and zero in on creative work? Um, and it must be tough with so much of California acreage on fire. Yeah, it's very difficult, but on the other hand, writing gives you a place to go. So the first thing I can suggest is headphones. Headphones, so you're not as, you're more in touch with what you're thinking and you're doing in your interior than you're not getting all this random, Mom, Mom, he's hitting me. You know, you, you can't hear every little thing that's going on. That you train people to respect you by respecting yourself. You know, if you don't respect your time and attention, nobody else is going to. Uh, so that's what makes writing hard, is that you're there, you're available, aren't you? If every time something, if they see you like hanging out, watching TV, when you said you were going to be writing, they're going to value, value your time and attention a lot less than if you say, I'm going to be writing from, you know, whenever you put the kids to bed, maybe. I'll be writing from uh, 9 to 10, and then you make it a point to sit down from nine to 10 and you're not gonna do anything but work. So that if somebody sees your screen, they are not gonna see Solitaire, they're not gonna see Facebook, they're not gonna see um, you goofing around. Um, 
that that's your time to write and you show people that you are serious by taking yourself seriously. You know, one of the things about, uh, you know, having the day job, I had a student who was um, a banker. Uh, he did financial litigation. He was a lawyer, uh, financial litigation. And he got up two hours early and I mean, he's probably the most, you know, disciplined person I've ever seen in my life. But he got up two hours early. He was writing this book about World War I, really dense kind of Thomas Mann stuff. And he'd get up two hours early and work on his World War I novel. I think he did a trilogy um, before work because he said he, he had the best energy before work. So you, you use the cream wherever you have the most energy and you give that to your writing even if it's 15 minutes, even if it's half hour. So this is my other advice is it doesn't, you don't have to have a huge unbroken amount of time. The important thing is the frequency, the dailiness of it, that you, you know, if you can give your work 15 minutes a day, if you can sit down and say, okay, I'm just going to dust it off, keep it alive, keep it on life support every day, and then you know where you have time in the day. You know, do you have 15 minutes in the morning? Half an hour, an hour. This kid had two hours. Uh, the banker, the, the lawyer. Um, you know, can you scrape together an hour in the morning? Can you get up at 7 instead of, or 6.30 instead of 7.30? Um, do you take an hour lunch? Can you sit at your desk and eat a sandwich and write instead of going out and having people don't do that right now, I imagine. But definitely, you can always find 15 minutes here and there. And that is really significant time that sometimes you uh, pass over. Noise-canceling headphones are fantastic. And they say word says there's signal to other people that you're working. You know, when you see that, there's a woman who I do these letters for Democrats that I'm writing. Um, and there's a woman who is a film producer who's in the uh, in that uh, group. And she said when her kids were little, she had a baseball cap that said producer on it. And that when she was wearing, she would when she was doing her movie work, she would put that hat on. And people knew that when she's got her producer hat on, not to bug her. Um, so you could have a right hat that says writer, like leave me alone. But you have to remember that when you put it on, or when you put those headphones on, that you have to respect yourself in that time. Uh, and that seems to be the biggest problem that people have, is saying we're going to set aside time to work, and then we're going to use that time to work and do it as if everyone was watching do it as if you know the muse was watching which which she is um that your very luck is involved um and then as far as the friends and family how to block out the world and zero in on creative work you have to stoke the fire that wants to do this more. If you're looking more to whip the donkey who doesn't want to do it, um, you can do that, but it's more important to stoke your excitement for doing the work and remember that this is something you are passionate about. So how do you stoke the passion? And that's where I, you know, I suggest you read books that make you want to write, not books to avoid the world. Um, I like to, you know, books about, um, you know, there's certain writers that if I read, you know, a few pages of their work, it makes me, it reconnects me to what I want to do. Um, so that's the, the more, the most important thing is to stoke the, the passion um, rather than how can I beat, beat myself to sit down and writing. It's much more to inspire yourself is much better than that.
Um, <laughs> when my kids were little, I had a sign made for my home office that said, unless you're bleeding, do not disturb me. They honored it mostly. But it seems like in this case, it's m more that the writer is having trouble honoring themselves, honoring their own commitment to working. And I think that making a certain time of the day, oh, it's my time, then you become like the dog with the leash in its mouth. It's time. It's time to work. It's time, you know, um, that you know that your time, you know, from 6.45 to 7.15 is my time to write. You'll, it'll become routine. And that's really important. Um, and then if people want to encroach on that time, you know, like Zoom meetings uh, with the family, I assume that's going to be after an after dinner thing. You know, so make a deadline. Say, you know, between 9 and 10 is my writing time. Um, not my TV time, not my grooving and moving and having a martini time. Um, nine to 10 I, is when I'm going to be working. So make sure if you're going to make a Zoom call with family to say, okay, it's got to, but I, I'll be gone at nine. I have to work. Uh, um, so Sayward says, I think a big problem with writing full time is that some think this is seven to eight hours in the chair. I work Tuesday through Friday, eight to nine to four, but only a couple of that is time uh, uh, creating new worlds. The, re the rest, new words, the rest is time spent on peripheral stuff, uh, you know, marketing and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you have to figure if if I'm... If I want to write, and I'm, you know, most people are not uh, full-time writers. I think this is a question of somebody with a day job and how to finagle a 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there, 30 minutes there. Put it together. Don't feel like I can't unless I have a big stretch of time. Uh, for people who have all day, that's the opposite problem. You know, how to focus, how to say, okay... I have all day to write. I'm going to do whatever I do until, say, 10. But at 10, I sit down and work. And I work till lunch, 10 to 1. And then I have lunch. Might be two hours. Fine. 3 o'clock, I'll sit down and do another hour. As long as you figure out what you're going to do and respect the decisions that you've made, this is where people have problems and you have to stoke the passion to do it so that you want to do it. It's very important. Uh, I suggest books like, you know, not only the, for me, there's certain writers who do it. Malcolm Lowry, I read Under the Volcano for 10 pages and I have to go write. I read Joyce, ten, you know, Ulysses for 10 pages, I have to go write. I read The Lover, Marguerite Dura. And I have to go write. Um, and I keep coming across writers like that that make me want to go write. And then there's also books that inspire, like Just Kids, uh, anything by Patti Smith, I find very uh, inspiring. Um, uh, there's a book called The Art Spirit. There's a book called by uh, Robert Henri for painters. Uh, but it applies to writing as well. Um, there's a book... Uh, uh, free play about uh, improvisation in art and life. Uh, and I find that incredibly inspiring. So you have to notice what inspires you to write <coughs> and then feed that passion as well as respecting your own time. Um, I'm spending time learning social media since my debut is being published at the end of the year, having trouble separating the fiction and brain and business size of the brain. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the difficulty with this is, um, what am I doing? Why is it fading out? Um, hmm. Did I reverse it? Yes. Yeah. The, ugh. <laughs> the different, you just got a close up of the ball of rope that holds up <laughs> my phone. Um, yeah, the, the difference between 
re, between the business and the writing is we talked about Tolstoy last week um, is that it's easier to do social media. It's easier to flog a book than it is to write. Writing is hard. Writing is hard because you bring, you don't know what's going to happen. It's all discovery. And you have to put so much of your brain to the task. And there's nobody on the other end liking, just, you know, liking things or there's nothing, you know, on the immediately on the other end. So it's going to be a question of very clearly of demarcating your writing time from your um, media time. And you can do that by alternating, you know, half hour of writing, then you get half hour of media. Whew. And then half hour on the writing, half hour of the media. You can do that, or you can say a block, the first block of time is going to be writing. You know, the first two hours will be writing, then you get an hour of media. Try to compress the amount of media, because we goof around a lot on that as well. It's not really business. It's a lot of other stuff. So instead of letting that go on all day, say, you know, I'm going to give it half, an hour in the morning, you know, an hour after I've written my morning shift and then, you know, 11 o'clock, I go on for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, get everything I need to get done, get back to work, back to writing. And then maybe in the afternoon, three, four o'clock, you get another 45 minutes or hour where you can compress it and then get over with it because it just keeps going on and on and on as opposed to writing where you, it's hard and you have to take breaks just because you're mentally, all the synapses have fried for a while and you need to heal them up a little bit. Um, Ruthie wrote during her lunch hour. Yeah, you know. Uh, it used to be people would take a whole hour for lunch and, you know, go out and go to a restaurant. So, psh, you know, you don't need that. Uh, Roberta finds listening to music without lyrics or that have lyrics in a language other than English or Spanish helps. Yeah, I find uh, I use sort of a droney, uh, at least for Marina, uh, kind of a droney... Um, I forgot the name of this kind of music, like Bauhaus and Russian circles. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, I think it's called drone music uh, that I find very helpful. Uh, something without a beat is helpful um, for me. Uh, but something that kind of, it's easy to ignore and separates you from the outside reality. Uh, yeah, Roberta, I, I, I go with that. Um, let's see, what can I, oops. Uh, say we're got up at five to write for an hour before work. Yeah, very important. And then you can take a nap, you know, at five or six when you get home from work, a little nap and clear your snaps again for the evening. Um, some people are morning people, some people are late night people. Uh, my daughter gets up late, you know, we're in the pandemic lockdown, but she gets up, you know, 11, maybe noon, and then she gets her work done in the middle of the night when everybody's asleep. Comfortable over-the-ear headphones. Um, I have a set. I mean, the noise canceling are the best. Um, I have these. I like red because they're easy to see, and they are made by Cowen, Cowen, uh, and they're wireless, and they don't they don't always work that great. But I can just actually put them on and get a lot of uh, noise noise uh, resistance, noise canceling. So anyway, um, the important thing is to sit down. Amy, I hope that you overcome your fear of the first draft. The fear is the fear of, if you look at some of the writer block uh, uh, videos that I've done so far, um, fear of sitting down is a fear of being lousy because the book in your head is so vivid 
and you're afraid that what you're actually going to write isn't going to be as good as what's in your head. And the truth is, it will not be as good as what's in your head. The book that I imagine my book is going to be is so much better than the book I'm writing. And so you have to let go of the book in your head, the book you wanted to write. There's only the book that you're actually writing. And even if it's not going to be the perfection of the book in your head, it's going to exist. It's going to exist in the physical world. Uh, there's no such thing as perfection in the physical world, so you have to let go of that idea. So anyway, uh, if there's no more questions, I am going to sign off. But please, if you are interested in a, it, an intense weekend on writing from the senses, and you know I always believe that we start from the senses. We start from the body. That's where we really live. And uh, the world is so rich when you start with the senses rather than like, hmm, what's going to happen to Bobby now? And it's very superficial. When you start with the body, then you're really getting in touch with the self that writes. And um, when, you know, so that's at uh, communityofwriters.org. Uh, dot dot and I will put it in, I'll put a... Um, a notice up on my author page of when and where that is. So this is the 9th, 10th, and 11th of October. And they're signing up now. So I uh, hope to see some of you there. And uh, uh, good luck with your uh, finding, clearing out time to work. You can do it. You can do it. All right. Take it easy. And we'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>